Hello everybody, welcome to episode 39 of Life and Life Only, and this is part two of Happiness, Darren Brown, Life and Death. This is a series of episodes, it looks like it's going to be four parts I think, because part two that we're doing here will take us to about halfway through the book. It's primarily me reading from the Darren Brown book, Happy, Why More or Less Everything is Absolutely Fine, and interjecting, as I've done many times on this podcast. If you haven't heard part one, obviously it would be a very good idea, but this could be listened to independently, I suppose. Anyway, let us crack on. There's a section called The Roots of Self-Inquiry. So Darren takes us on a journey through various thinkers, starting with the Greek philosophers, about self-inquiry and happiness. Starting with Socrates, in his book Philosophy for Life, Jules Evans sets out four steps of the Socratic tradition, That is the type of inquiry that grew from the time of Socrates, the first philosopher to bring the field away from early metaphysical discussions and take it to the people. Socrates was also the first to offer the advice, know thyself, and said that the considered life was the only one worth living. The influence of this short, ugly, modest man who wandered the streets of ancient Athens encouraging people to join him in conversation has continued to this day. Although varied and conflicting philosophies have grown from his descendants, they have in common a method of self-inquiry which we can trace to Socrates and which we would do well to consider as we contemplate our own lives. Here are the four stages set out by Evans and upon which any presumption of change through philosophical consideration is based. Just before I read them, the know thyself advice, I think has often been ascribed to Shakespeare. In Hamlet, there is the line, to thine own self be true which is obviously not quite the same thing, but both very good advice. Be true to yourself, try to live authentically, but also know thyself, including the dark sides, I would say. So, the four stages. Number one, humans can know themselves. We can use our reason to examine our unconscious beliefs and values. Number two, humans can change themselves. We can use our reason to change our beliefs. This will change our emotions, because our emotions follow our beliefs. Number three, humans can consciously create new habits of thinking, feeling and acting. Number four, if we follow philosophy as a way of life, we can live more flourishing lives. Now in part one I briefly discussed, and read in fact, some things about us having a default level of happiness. And I was talking about how fundamental change can happen and profound change can happen. Generally it's over time, but you will find that you might go back to a default level of happiness. I talked in the first part, I think, about lottery winning and becoming uh, rich and famous, or just rich, in fact, and how it would change your life for a time, but then you'd return to this baseline. But really what he's saying here is that you can change, which I agree with. As Evans points out, it's the fourth step that is most complex because different people and philosophers have varying notions of what a flourishing life might entail. And included in the rest of this book are some different options for what might constitute step four. Each is tantalising in its own way, and each will appeal to a different temperament. Unavoidably, I am biased towards those philosophies that sit best with my personality. My nature is a little on the introverted side, which is ideal for our purposes, as the vast majority of philosophers are and were too. More extrovert personalities might find themselves constitutionally unsuited to chunks of this book's advice. But as we all exist on a sliding scale between these two personality types, we can all make use of the kind of philosophy we will consider. We can all use it to build the foundations of our inner home from which we can best and most safely enjoy the light and breezy heights of the upper floors. So a nice bit of poetic writing there from Darren. A couple of points there. You generally don't have pure introverts and pure extroverts. So there is a spectrum the same as madness, (laughs) the bipolar spectrum. You have extreme cases of bipolar, you have very, very, very balanced people, but most people fly somewhere in the middle there. And the other thing is that he says I'm biased towards certain philosophies. Just as a general note, I'm sure I've said before on the podcast that understanding that we are all biased and that pure objectivity is very difficult, possibly even impossible. Okay, it's okay to have biases, it's okay to be subjective, it doesn't make you a bad person. Okay, just moving forward a little bit. Milan Kundera made the enduring point in the unbearable likeness of being that there is no dress rehearsal for life. This is life. This is it right now. It is a powerful and motivating thought. Each moment you live passes and is gone, never to return. Life is too brief to not consider how to experience it at its best. 
This is not about bungee jumping or forming an extravagant bucket list. It can happen in the ordinary moments of your everyday life. Life is short, we know this. But there is a contradictory thought which I find every bit as exhilarating and which was central to the writings of the German 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. It is called eternal recurrence, an idea that he drew from Indian philosophy. Time is infinite, Nietzsche points out, while the chances of a world appearing exactly like our own is, though very, very small, not quite zero. This means that eventually, as we move through infinite time, a world exactly like ours will appear again. In that world, of course, there will exist a repeated version of you, living exactly your life each time. If time is eternal, every configuration of events that has already happened will at some point happen again, and that will include a reliving of your life by a future version of yourself. Nietzsche finds the idea at first horrifying. That horror, however, leads to his realisation that a person living a considered and truly affirmed life would be happy for it to be lived over and over again for eternity. Yes, it's an interesting thought. I was musing uh, recently, in fact, while reading this book, because towards the end we'll talk a little bit about the idea of eternal life. If you could have eternal life, would you want it? And I was thinking, <laughs> I don't know if it says something about me, but that thought would just horrify me. I, I would like to have, uh, you know, a longish life. I'd like to just have a full life, which I think I have had already. And um, I wouldn't want to go on and on, especially... Um, if I reach uh, 80 years old, 90 years old, I think quality of life is so important. But yeah, it's an interesting idea. I don't think the average person, including me, would really has really considered that particularly. I think people are more interested in the idea of a parallel universe, that there's a universe happening right at this moment, and that perhaps if you've had unrealised dreams, which probably most of us have had, there's a parallel universe where you did become a film star or a rock star. Not that it's going to make you happier, which is obviously something that's uh, touched on in this book. But maybe in that parallel universe you get to live out some dreams that you've had. I would go more with the life is short, just as a mental exercise to help you appreciate life a bit more. Now Darren says, I don't know if the basis of Nietzsche's idea really holds up. For one thing, time may not be infinite. The universe as we know it will come to some sort of end. And even if a future version of ourselves lives out our life again, it will not be us, in the sense that we will not share a sense of personal identity with him or her. It needn't worry us now. For all you know, you may already be living out a life identical to someone before you. And it doesn't follow that either of you should be bothered by the fact. But such technicalities aside, the thought is a compelling one. Would you live your life over and over again exactly as it happened? Is your centre of gravity within you? with your self-image sturdy and tenacious, or is it outside of you, and woefully subject to the inconstancies of fate and the intimations of others? And when you reach the end of this life, will you feel you have lived a life worth living? It's not necessarily an answer given to that, but sometimes the questions are, are more fun than the answers. Okay, then we have um, a chapter called A Very Brief History of Happiness. If you have had the experience of travelling abroad and noticing customs that differ from our own, then you'll appreciate that one way to bring something intangible and largely unquestioned into sharp focus is to contrast it with other cultures where different fundamental presumptions are at work. It's hard to realise, for example, how eager we British are to avoid embarrassment until one has travelled to other countries where such an idiosyncrasy is not embedded into life. I remember when living in Würzburg in southern Germany, a friend telling me how he'd been sitting at a bus stop, one leg crossed over the other in such a way that the heel of one foot contacted the plastic bench. An elderly lady, passing on the other side of the street, spotted this transgression. She crossed over the road, muttering admonishments in her curt Franconian dialect, raised her hand to the offending foot and slapped it. It was an extraordinary bit of business and highlighted our own presumptions about what we take to be acceptable behaviour from an old lady in this country. If cultural comparisons might offer us a horizontal view of happiness in context, history can give us a vertical perspective. And as it is ultimately from history that I believe we can find the most effective answers to improving our happiness, this is the route I want to take in this chapter. And then he talks about a character in Christopher Isherwood's A Single Man, a college student, who says, All I'm saying is the past doesn't really matter to most kids my age. When we talk like it does, we're just being polite. I guess that's because we don't have any past of our own, except stuff we want to forget, like things in high school and times we acted like idiots. But Darren um, 
suggests that we toast the past and unsettle a few presumptions about this seemingly straightforward idea of happiness. Darren says, our notions of happiness are a product of the age that we live in. And he talks about Darren McMahon's book, The Pursuit of Happiness, which is a, a history of happiness. If you believe you're entitled to be happy, that this is a given for any human being, then read on. This notion of a right to happiness is a very modern idea, and as I've already said, the cause of much anxiety. And then he puts the blame squarely on Socrates in a plainful way. We have one brilliant man to blame for the muddle. Now, just going back to those cultural differences thing, when I was living in um, Thailand, so many of the people I worked with and the expats that I would see around, they had this extraordinary attitude of just seemingly spending all day, not all of them, there were some nice ones, but there were a lot of alcoholics or semi-alcoholics and quite jaded people, I suppose, quite embittered. And they, they would seemingly spend the whole day, all their time, just criticising Thai people and basically criticising the differences between uh, them and us. What I thought would, would have been a much better idea is to take the best bits of us and take the best bits of Thai culture and uh, incorporate them. But they seem to be always fighting against it. And when James Corbett was on a couple of years ago, I asked him, because he used to be a teacher in Japan, I said, you know, were they grizzled expats who'd been there for years and were never going to leave, but just seem to hate it or just vocalise everything they didn't like. He said, oh, yeah, absolutely. And it, what came to me in the moment was the way that some of these expats talk about the locals is exactly the justification for colonising these countries, apart from, of course, the economic thing. The way they were perceived, oh, these are primitive locals. If they were just more like us, everything would be all right. We need to civilise them. So that was an interesting thing. But yeah, you know, they say travel broadens the mind, and absolutely. But the important thing is that you have to travel with an open mind. If you travel to a, you know, a culture like Thailand, Egypt, these cultures that seem very far from our culture, if you go there fighting against it with a, your staunchly English or American or Australian, wherever you come from, you're kind of superior in anything away from the norm you're going to react against, then you're not going to have a great time and you're not really going to be helping the world helping the cultures understand each other. Yes, travel with an open mind. So we are back to Socrates, and then after that is Plato, and then Aristotle. By the way, if you ever want to remember the order of the three um, most famous Greek philosophers, just think of the word spa, S-P-A. Plato was something of a disciple of Socrates, and then Aristotle was something of a disciple of Plato, but they ended up, Plato and Aristotle in a way, being quite critical of each other and of Socrates. There's way too much to distill, so I'm actually going to go forward. There's some talk of virtue, and uh, Darren tells us that the word virtue is not quite, wasn't quite used in those days the way that it's used now. Virtue may seem to us to be a very outmoded concept, as to many does the concept of the soul. This latter term we can mentally substitute with the innermost person, though I quite enjoy the no-fuss employment of soul. Virtue, however, appears to the modern mind's eye in only faint adumbrations of nightly incorruptibility. We rarely talk of people today in terms of their goodness or their virtue. We might describe someone as an upstanding pillar of the community, but such a cliché does not seem to touch upon the inner life of that person. But the original notion of virtue, since developed and debated by philosophers, religions and psychologists over the years, is quite different from the implications of courtly or virginal decorum it later absorbed during the Middle Ages. And he goes on to explain that virtue, as it was used then, was much more of a rational and pragmatic part of a, as a guide for living, as he calls it. There is something powerful in the idea that we recognise reason as something unique in ourselves, something that separates us from the animals, and that our aim should be to bring that to its most virtuous completion. According to Aristotle, we can enjoy trivial pleasures, but these should only be in preparation for activities in accordance with virtue. He believed that human beings are meant for greater things, and that a certain joy comes from fulfilling what is best and most noble in our nature. He says, perhaps Aristotle's vision for happiness seems like too much hard work. Most of the time we prefer to watch television or browse the net to take our minds off our worries. These anaesthetics certainly seem to do the job, but what happens when numbing diversions are not enough? When we lie awake in the early hours, resenting some situation or other in our life? 
The experiencing self might have been happy with a few hours of gaming to distract it from the niggling annoyances left over from a work colleague's promotion, a partner's refusal to help with the dishes, or our useless display before someone we were eager to impress. Yet the remembering self forms an excruciating narrative in which we have let ourselves down or been unfairly treated. When others sleep, it of course likes to vividly replay those stories, enthusiastically alerting us to each and every agonising detail. So what he was saying there, he was saying that Aristotle's what would seem now quite heavy idea that when we're not working, we should be working on ourselves, you know, in deep contemplation. Darren's saying, well, most of us would prefer to watch TV or play video games as a diversion. But he says, um, he mentions there the remembering self and the experiencing self. This is something that came up in part one. And it's a very important point that, as it says, the experiencing self is the one in the moment that I think we often tend to follow. We follow that instinct. Oh, let's have a good time now. And the remembering self is the memory we have of it. So I think we gave the example in part one. I can't remember what the exact example, but it was something like, uh, you know, you can either eat a cheeseburger or help someone. It wasn't that example, but let's use it anyway. <laughs> Do something like eat a pizza, maybe hang out at a pizza parlour or spend an hour, I don't know, doing voluntary work or something like that. The pizza parlour probably would please your senses and your experiencing self, but you might have a greater memory of the hour you spent helping people. If we hope for something deeper in life than distraction, we might hope that our remembering, story-forming self needs a narrative of happiness in the same way our experiencing self requires its pleasures. And here we might find that we sleep more peacefully if we see our lives as part of Aristotle's telos, as a work in progress, one in which we could view daily irritations as a kind of test, one which teaches us virtue and where we can, step by step, and by considering the variables of each situation as it happens, move towards being a better and then in brackets, happier, kinder, more fulfilled version of ourselves. We are in the realm here of the considered life and the possibility of serenity that such a life can offer. People take longer-lasting pleasure from being kind to others than having others be kind to them. Likewise, there is a deeper happiness to be had in knowing that your life is part of a story of flourishing than there is in merely pursuing entertainment. Yes, I'd go along with that. And uh, in many happiness studies, it has been found that people who help others do gain you know there's a school of thought that says every act you do is selfish in one sense but it's not necessarily using selfish as a criticism it's a selfish relating to the self you're getting something out of it as well but that should give you even more reason to help other people because basically everyone's a winner i should perhaps note there is um very much a virtue signaling component to social media and in theonion.com, which is a satirical news website, which completely debunks the idea that Americans don't understand irony. Someone on The Onion clearly does. They had a, a mock headline, something along the lines of, a month volunteering in one of the poorest parts of Africa helps Facebook profile picture. It was something like that. It was the idea that someone had gone there, had done a month's volunteering in a poor country or a poor area to... Uh, improve their Facebook profile picture. In part one, we did talk about a part in this book where he talks about if, if you were the only human left and you had access to everything in the world, would you want to wear diamond rings and uh, expensive watches and live in a massive house if you didn't have anyone to impress? And I thought that was a really interesting part of the book. Now, carrying on, going back to uh, talking about Aristotle, there are other qualities about Aristotle's approach that are worth noting here. Firstly, like Socrates, his method of teaching about the good life was to engage his pupils in a discussion. His was not the role of an authoritarian instructor. Instead, he encouraged discourse, and the students completed the ethical instruction by taking what they had learnt and contributing further to it by thought and application in their own lives. Through this dialectic back-and-forth process, the classes could sift through and identify the most pertinent issues. Using an analogy of an archer before a target, Aristotle believed that ethical inquiry could allow us to see our target more clearly. The aim was not to identify the target as such, but to allow us to discriminate better and see more clearly. This approach sits well with the notion of pupils continuing their own instruction through engagement in rational argument and self-discovery. They might then come to identify differing targets for themselves, having developed the keen archer's eye through their study. And I'd like to mention the meet-up group that I have. I started it a couple of years ago and 
it's got down to about nine of us. I actually left the Meetup website and we just do it by email now. But it's nine of us who are all interested in this kind of discussion. It's not heavy discussion, but it, it's somewhat akin to the way this book is written, really. It's um, accessible and light to some extent while dealing with heavy topics. And it's amazing because it's very rare that nine of us are ever available. So it always seems to be a different combination. There's generally five, six, seven of us. And I start off, or someone starts off, nowadays it's a bit more um, open to anyone to start off a topic, just to suggest a topic by email. And then we meet in the pub on the same night every couple of weeks. And we have discussions. And, and the magic of it is that we have a kind of agreement that no one's going to get offended. And we can speak freely, obviously not abusively, but just freely and frankly. And the discussions go to all kinds of places, you know, all kinds of areas. Sometimes we change topic completely, which is really the idea in the first place is that we have a topic to get things going. But yeah, then after that, it goes where it goes. But conversation is such a wonderful thing. And what's very important is the attitude of the people. You could have a guru figure like Socrates or Plato or Aristotle, or they would appear a guru to the, the others who would consider themselves mere mortals. But the important thing is discussion and open discussion and letting that happen. Same with podcasts, of course. I mean, I have a topic. This one, of course, is quite structured in the sense that I'm reading particular bits from this book. I've written down page numbers and things, but the interjections part of it is probably the magic for me. Now we get on to Stoicism, which, as I said in part one, is something that Darren Brown has become associated with because he's publicly said that he is a fan, if you like, of the Stoics or believes that they were on the right lines with a lot of their beliefs. This is just a short paragraph Stoicism, founded by Zeno of Citium and named after the Stoa, the covered walkway in the Athenian marketplace where this new philosophy was expounded, also saw happiness in terms of tranquility, and like Epicureanism, its approach centred on ensuring the absence of pain. Stoics taught, along with the Epicureans, that we should limit our desires, and that perceived problems in life are due to errors in judgment about those problems. If we change our attitude, the pain of those external factors can disappear. This may sound familiar to modern minds acquainted with the notion of reframing a problem as an opportunity. It is one of the Stoics' most powerful and prevailing ideas. So yes, this reframing is a big part of life coaching and CBT and it's taking what appears to be negative and seeing the positive in it, but not in a naive way, in a real sense. A classic example would be if you break up with your partner, someone that you were in love with they broke up with you or you just realized that the relationship wasn't working there'd be a lot of pain involved but you might over time think to yourself well this is an opportunity to meet someone who might make me even happier he then takes us through a history of various schools of thought regarding happiness he talks about christianity and describes it as happiness on a plate you don't have to keep considering your own life all you need to have is faith in God. Now, of course, a lot of Christians, I'm sure Julian Charles, who's the spiritual brother of this podcast, I named him, I'm sure he does a lot more than just say, oh, it's all in God's hands. But uh, as I said, right at the beginning of part one, some people are followers, some people are leaders, and some people just want to find their own path. He then talks about original sin, and then we go through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And essentially... There's a constant swing, rather like in the old days when we had a left and a right in politics. The country would swing towards one or the other, and one would have a certain shelf life and be flavour of the month. And then when people realised that wasn't working, then they would and we'll give the other we give the other side a chance. So there's a sort of swing between beliefs in our actions as fate, you know, the the actions of the universe, and that we just have to trust in the universe which of course is not a million miles away from just trusting in God. And then other schools where they said, no, you have to be active in creating your own happiness and creating your own life. So that's an interesting swing. And then finally, over many hundreds of years, we get to Mr. Freud, who I've always had a very big interest in. And I'll just read a little bit of that. The 20th century saw the fairly abrupt end of romantic sentimentality and replaced it with a rather more sceptical take on happiness. Whereas those before him had reclaimed the natural right to be truly happy through self-examination, through nature or through work, 
Sigmund Freud saw such a goal as dangerously naive. The creator of psychoanalysis and the man synonymous with the discovery of the unconscious saw instead a natural unhappiness as the preferred aim. The modest goal of his revolutionary talking therapy was a removal of neurotic or unnatural forms of unhappiness and a restoration of the patient, brackets somewhat surprisingly to modern ears, to an ordinary balance of everyday dissatisfaction. Life is not supposed to be plain sailing. Well, very interesting. Right at the beginning of Life and Life Only, I think it was episode two, I did an episode called Cynicism and Free Thought. It was talking about something that Darren mentioned about how a positive attitude, as exemplified by the secret, as you remember in part one, just this blindly positive attitude, the sledgehammer of positivity, I called it, is not enough. Perhaps for a full life, you need to go to the dark places and not avoid them. According to Freud's model, we seek to satisfy various unconscious desires created during early childhood, but unfortunately must submit to the demands of civilization. This tension denies us the fulfillment of our true animal-like needs, and we are pulled between the two opposing drives, our aims and the demands of society. The resulting conflict needs to a necessary sublimation of those frustrated urges, which can mean for us the emergence of troublesome symptoms. And Darren talks about that somewhere in this book. If you do have these childhood hang-ups, let's call it, I think issues is a perhaps a fashionable word for it now, you perhaps do need to deal with them to some extent, either with a therapist or with someone else, a friend, or just by yourself, because they will come up in other ways. And I think Freud is absolutely right that the human urges and our, what you might call our true selves, don't really fit with modern society. I don't think the nuclear family, for example, is particularly natural i don't think monogamy is natural but at the same time i think monogamy is the best thing for a relationship definitely but something like the nuclear family and especially now i saw with my sisters who had kids what a struggle it is you know i talked about advertising and marketing in part one and they're just bombarded by it when they took their kids out in the street the kids would see all this very very clever advertising far too clever for a child to understand, or even perhaps an adult. And uh, the children would be pointing at things, saying, I want that, I want this. Advertising to children is just horrendous. Don't study it too much, is my advice. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with this tension. In modern life, particularly, we're fighting against our... I don't know, natural... I said in part one, I have a problem with the word natural... I'm not sure what's human nature and what's human conditioning. But anyway, I think um, modern life is going against some sort of natural way that we would like to be to satisfy our urges. And of course, there's dark urges as well. And and that comes out in our appreciation of, I don't know, horror films and fascination with serial killers and psychopaths and things like that. Like I say, I wouldn't call myself or label myself a Freudian, but I find his work incredibly interesting. Back to uh, Schopenhauer here. Arthur Schopenhauer also spoke of the unconscious mind half a century before Freud officially revealed it, describing its relationship to the intellect thus. The intellect remains so much excluded from the real resolutions and secret decisions of its own will that sometimes it can only get to know them, like those of a stranger, by spying out and taking it unawares, and it must surprise the will in the act of expressing itself in order merely to discover its real intentions. We've also got Nietzsche here. Nietzsche also spoke of the unconscious. Freud probably disingenuously claimed until late in his life never to have read either of these philosophers. But Schopenhauer's pessimism and Nietzsche's optimism were both well acquainted with the automatic stirrings of the mind. And Freud's concept of the id, that instinctive self in which our primal processes are manifest, seems to be closely related to Schopenhauer's will. But it is Freud who has left us with the lingering story of those unfulfilled drives that motivate our desires and compromise our most tender-hearted and altruistic urges. Freud's theories killed Dickens. Easy sentiment in art was no longer plausible or interesting, and our modern tendency to root our problems in the past was born. The story of Oliver Twist today would be a very different psychosexual tale hinged on the effects of an absent mother. Freud himself, an effervescent prose stylist and prescient revolutionary thinker, has since been somewhat denounced and his psychoanalytic theory labelled passé, even sexist. Psychoanalysis is today synonymous with a long-term, arduous process of self-exploration that has become the stuff of comedy. So here's a quote from Woody Allen. 
I was in analysis. I was suicidal. As a matter of fact, I would have killed myself. But I was in analysis with a strict Freudian. And if you kill yourself, they make you pay for the sessions you miss. And then he talks about, um, in America in particular, neo-Freudianism. Shifting the emphasis from suppressed trauma within the individual to the ongoing relationship between client and therapist. And ultimately, a greater emphasis on the here and now. Now, CBT deals with the present. CBT is very practical. It's cognitive behavioural therapy, by the way. And it gets you to try and look at what's happening right now. You know, when you, when you get triggered, uh, instead of just letting it happen, just stop for a second and say, right, what is this trigger? Where is it coming from? Why am I experiencing it? And that's absolutely fine. It really it depends what your aim is. If your aim is just to improve your everyday life and try and avoid daily habits, if you like, if you think of getting angry as a habit, almost... A trigger point then it can work with that but uh it depends how deep you want to go really i mean i don't think everybody is obligated to get to the deepest darkest realms of their soul and examine them but obviously if you have deep-seated issues that are affecting other people be it people in your family or maybe you're a boss who is a really terrible boss a bully who preys on their staff because you've got major issues with being undermined as a child or something like that, I think you should deal with that for the sake of everybody. But uh, as Darren said earlier in the book, as we talked about in part one, you know, it's expensive as well. But you can work on yourself. And of course, there is copious literature and podcasts and videos. It's, it's really all there. I was saying in my meetup group the other day, we don't need any new ideas. People are always saying, oh, we need new, fresh ideas. We don't. Everything we've ever needed to make this a great world is already out there and probably was out there thousands of years ago. It's all there, folks. You know, you just have to make a point of looking for it. And then after all that history, we get to today. Today, we very much remain heirs to romanticism in several areas relating to happiness. Above all, matters of love and spirituality remain swathed in an opaque sentimental mist, which renders them immune to any kind of rational investigation. In our lonely age, where we seek connections perhaps more than ever before, we benefit enormously from opening those topics to intelligent discussion and myth-busting. Meanwhile, if Freud paved the way for our modern enthusiasm for diagnosis, we are now in the age of the happy pill. Allied to therapeutic intervention and the enthusiastic diagnosing of conditions, it's now the case that medication, prescribed or otherwise, is playing a large part in our concept of happiness. As diagnoses of unipolar and bipolar depression become more widespread, demand for psychopharmaceutical solutions rises symbiotically. Cayman's experiencing self finds itself the centre of attention, while our story-forming, remembering half remains unnourished. And just to touch on the outer truth part of Life and Life Only, there's an interesting point that things that would be considered conspiracy theories or paranoid thinking become accepted over time. And I think with the... Um, all the debate over the COVID vaccines. Out of nowhere almost, it's now out in the open that pharmaceutical companies might not be solely there for our best interest, that they might actually be making money and lots and lots of money and sponsoring the news, you know. The news, sponsored by Pfizer. Meet the Press Data Download, brought to you by Pfizer. This portion of CBS This Morning, sponsored by Pfizer. On how to find the hidden sugars in the American family diet, Sponsored by Pfizer. Making a difference. Brought to you by Pfizer. CNN Tonight. Brought to you by Pfizer. Early start. Brought to you by Pfizer. Friday night on Aaron Burnett out front. Brought to you by Pfizer. This week with George Stephanopoulos is brought to you by Pfizer. Good Morning America is brought to you by Pfizer. CBS Health Watch sponsored by Pfizer. Anderson Cooper 360. Brought to you by Pfizer. ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by Pfizer. That's not really controversial anymore. Yes, we are in the age of the happy pill, but I think, you know, there's a maybe there's going to be a backlash against that and that people won't just rush for pills because, again, everything is out there. You know, meditation, yoga. I was saying to my dad when I was visiting my parents that I got my dad into meditation about six years ago at the age of 70, and it's absolutely changed his life. And I was saying, yeah, just that alone, just if everyone in the world meditated a bit and did some yoga, diets would change, states of mind would change, but perhaps the people who make money from these things don't want that to change. The next section is called Stoic Building Blocks. 
Again, there's so much here. I won't be able to go through it all. If you're interested in stoicism, there's good podcasts about it. I found a couple. And one of the key texts, I suppose, is Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. He was, of course, a Roman emperor. And it wasn't intended. He wasn't intended to write a book. It's essentially diary entries to himself. But they illustrate the Stoic building blocks pretty well. And he obviously gets a mention, not surprisingly, in this book. Now, in, the, in this section... Darren writes about the tension between our desires and what we already have. And I have a question for you, really, the listeners. What's the proportion of time you spend thinking about what you already have versus what you could have? Once again, we've got the advertising angle here, constantly in a very subtle way telling you that what you have is not enough and you need this brand to make you happy. But how often do you, I don't know, stop You and your partner, you stop your busy lives and you just say, I'm really happy with what I've got here. Nothing is ever going to be perfect, but uh, it's worth just occasionally taking that time. I'm amazed in my own life how little time I spend just stopping and observing. And as I was saying in part one, when I got this illness recently, it hit me quite hard for about a week, but I had these twilight hours where I was really quite enjoying it while still feeling awful physically. It was a really contemplative time and I was taking stock. You know, I spent, I don't know, an hour or two in the middle of the night taking stock of things and I was thinking about my past life and remembering stuff that had happened to me and stuff I'd done. It was uh, quite a magic time. It's not always going to be good, you know, when you think back, you might think about embarrassing things you've done. I do that a lot, you know. I have to try and get them out of my mind as quickly as possible, but... Yes, you know, just take a bit of time, you know, five minutes, ten minutes, either with a loved one or just on your own, and just think, you know, I am lucky. Another thing, um, people have done surveys, a set of happiness and gratitude comes out. It's been made into something a bit cheesy, you know, the gratitude journal, and it has to be ten things, and the shallower parts of the self-help industry have managed to make that into this thing which is becomes almost like a task. But I think just every now and again, you, you can write it down, or you can just think it, just think about how damn lucky you are, you know. When I was um, talking about the subtitle of the book, I was saying that this is catering, that part of it anyway is catering to people whose lives probably are pretty much all right and that they're not on the poverty line, you know, they're not on the bread line. And if you are in that situation, you've, quote-unquote, already won the lottery. Now, there's a little anecdote here from Darren about possessions. He says, I remember mewling in the foothills of the Atlas Mountains a few years ago, my gorgeous beast of burden guided by a local man, Muhammad. After we had explored the hills, he invited me into the small, simple Berber house that he shared with his wife, sister, and eight other family members. Between them, his family seemed to own very few things. From what I could see, the list couldn't have run to much more than some prayer mats, a framed quotation from the Koran, which hung above a door, a teapot and cups and some mint tea, some items of crockery, candles and candle holders, a cupboard, a couple of rugs, some simple furniture and clothes, a handful of photographs of some pale tourists he'd taken around on his mule, and a mule. As he poured me a sweet tea, I asked if he'd ever been abroad. He laughed and pointed through a small square hole in the clay wall at the mountain range beyond and said, Why would I? I have everything here to be happy. I tried to contain the self-loathing that surfaced as I remembered my irritation that morning at the intermittency of the hotel Wi-Fi. We remember Epicurus's thought, everything we need is easy to procure, while the things we desire but don't need are more difficult to obtain. Darren has a wonderful line in uh, mocking himself and uh, the shallowness of the privileged, privileged in a relative way. You know, that we we do get irritated if Wi-Fi isn't great and we've lost all sense of what are real problems. You know, there's that phrase, first world problems. This has almost been made into a cliché of the... The mountain man who doesn't need much stuff, but as I said, part one, yeah, it's anything can be called a cliche, you know, just because it's been said a lot. Darren says, We live in an age where conspicuous consumption, the purchasing of goods to display our economic success, and invidious consumption, purchasing in order to make others envy us, are so commonplace we barely notice we're engaging in them. Advertisements generally work on the principle of creating in us a feeling that we lack something and then providing the means to fill it. The writer David Foster Wallace describes their goal as to, quote, create an anxiety relievable by purchase. The shiny toy will fill that need, whether it's to look or feel as good as the beautiful people who use the product in the ad, 
or to be free of some undesirable quality that up until that moment we didn't know we had. Conspicuous and invidious consumption are hallmarks of capitalism and they have a powerful effect on us. Producers of goods saturate the market with their products and shout so loudly about them that we fail to hear the quieter voices pointing out serious concerns such as sustainability of resources and worker conditions. We blankly read on our phones a news story of safety nets being installed to prevent staff suicides at the plant where that same phone was manufactured. And then when the Wi-Fi fails again and we can't switch to YouTube to watch pets being shamed, we denounce it as a piece of crap. Again, I would caution you, if you decide that you want to know how the minerals are mined that create your smartphone, get ready for some serious trauma in terms of the information that you will receive. That's up to you. Something you might want to look up is planned obsolescence. Darren, in fact, talks about planned obsolescence, so he doesn't use the phrase itself. We're driven to buying the latest computer, even though the tiny part that makes the new one more powerful could easily be slotted into our previous model. What has happened, at a psychological level so obvious that we never think about it, is that we've all but forgotten what our tastes are. We see the illusion of individual predilection being maintained, for example, in the array of different styles of iPhone cases available to us. We wonder which of the provided range of colourful or sophisticated sheaths best communicates to the world our unique character. Thus we lean towards the Wood Effect or the Batman one, or the vintage Union Jack. Meanwhile, it's much harder to honestly ask ourselves whether our lives would be improved were we not to be attached to our devices quite as umbilically, and how much misery they bring us alongside the various conveniences and amusements. Whether we might be more authentically ourselves if, with a pioneering and curious spirit, we occasionally left them at home. And in my meetup group there was a lady who was telling me that a school had done an experiment where they persuaded the students to give up their smartphones for a certain amount of time, and then they asked them what the results were, and they all had to admit that they all felt better. (laughs) That's very interesting, this idea of what are my tastes. Because I was talking to someone recently about... I told them I was doing this thing about happiness. And I was describing my work. And and he said, which bit of your work makes you happy? And I was struggling. I was thinking, do I think about my own happiness now? Do I practice what I preach? I don't think you necessarily have to practice everything you preach. Sometimes you could know that something is a good idea, but struggle to do it yourself in your own life. I don't think it makes you a hypocrite because... We're all flawed and we can't always do all the things that we would uh, expound. But I was thinking, do I ever sit down and say to myself, am I happy? Or have I somehow transcended that? And I feel like I'm probably more stimulated than happy. You know, because I've got a lot of things going on, various jobs and work, doing a bit of writing when I can and doing these podcasts and having the meetup group and stuff. I'm not sure if I uh, really think about that. And what are our tastes? I think our tastes have gone so far to the point where they're influenced externally that we think to ourselves, if I didn't feel like I had to buy things, because there's also a very clever thing that advertising does that makes you feel guilty that you're not buying (laughs) it. It's very subtle and it's terrible, really, but uh, it happens. Obviously, we know to some extent what we like, and as you get older, you get to know yourself a bit better, I think. But there's so much external influence and so many things pulling at us that I think perhaps we do lose sight of what our tastes are and what we actually like and don't like and whether we're happy or not and why. I think in the end, though, it comes down to fundamentals. Let's say relationships in general, which includes family, friends and romantic relationships and health. Really only those two things in one sense. All the rest, you know, hobbies and being creative and going on holiday and things, they're added extras if you like but even health i mean we'll get to a bit later it's probably going to be in part 49 of this the way it's going but towards the end of the book he talks um i think i may mention this in part one to a lady who has cancer as i was saying regarding this um covid that I recently had i wouldn't wish it on somebody but um even health can be reframed but i think we wouldn't do too well if we didn't have any relationships of any kind now, there are people that do it people who live in isolation but would they claim to be happy? I don't know. Perhaps they just claim to be doing what felt right. I don't know. Yes, this bring up far more questions than I've got answers for. He talks also about the worry of missing out. That's uh, commonly known as FOMO, fear of missing out. That's another one of those modern expressions. He quotes um, Chomsky, the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum. 
Absolutely brilliant quote there. Yeah, keep the Overton window, as it's called, nice and narrow, but then get everyone fired up to talk about what in the end is quite trivial when you actually know how the world is working behind the scenes. I think Partygate in England is a perfect example of that. You know, it's putting everyone's attention on the fact that Boris and his friends had a COVID party without masks when they told other people not to. And there are way more important and egregious things that he and his mates have done. The flourishing capitalist model creates and controls taste and leaves us all largely equivalent, each of us buying variations on the same theme and forgetting what we might have otherwise chosen for ourselves. A large part of the popularity of psychotherapy is explained by the fact that the demands of a consumer society have made us neglect our standpoints We've allowed our centre of gravity to be shifted to a point outside of ourselves and have lost track of what we actually might want and like in our lives. So I've just read Darren saying what I just uh, said a minute ago anyway. Sorry about that. Why not hear it twice? He talks more about consumer goods and the development of astonishingly advanced but short lifespan disposable consumer goods. These are the kind of things, if you take a step back, try to leave the consumer world for certain amount of time for me it was definitely throwing away my tv x amount of years ago i've talked about this many times i think on the podcast i didn't literally throw it away and i probably was still watching stuff i still watch stuff on screens but i don't have the tv on and have it basically programming quote unquote my view of the world which so much of it is about looking up to celebrities you know, talk shows, news, whatever it is, entertainment shows, and uh, buying stuff. Those are the two things I think you get the most from a TV life. And he talks about the buzz that we get from um, a new product coming out. and says, this is an addictive, attractive high for the experiencing self. The advertising images that tend to mirror this first-person perspective and language of size and colour are designed to trigger this rewarding, intensifying capacity of our nervous systems. This capacity expands unfocused to define our lifestyles for better or worse in the case of rampant consumerism, thrill-seeking and extreme sports, or the uncritical pursuit of religious or mystical experiences. Pseudoscience is appealing because it is exciting and intense. Science, by contrast, is slow and boring. But we are no longer children tearing round the house with toy weapons, building imaginary worlds to keep us enthralled. Or if we are, we might expect to eventually crash and burn. And he reiterates a point here. If we were the last person on earth, we wouldn't bother with buffetless ventilators or ironic iPhone cases. When the desire to impress others is removed, we live a more authentically Epicurean existence. And again, we should not make the mistake of thinking that Epicurus would deny us such things as a fancy fan. Instead, he would have us not cultivate the need for such things in the first place, so that the pain of losing them when they are broken, lost or stolen would not compromise any enjoyment we might obtain from them in the meantime. There is more to Epicurus's advice. He reminds us to desire what we already have, rather than to desire more and more unnecessary things. Quote, Do not spoil what you have by desiring what you have not. Remember that what you now have was once among the things you only hoped for. So he's not suggesting a purely negative process of resisting the lure of advertising and making sure we don't become too attached to unnecessary things. We can also re-evaluate the things we do have. If we're going to feel a little too attached to the idea of an iPhone, let's allow ourselves to nurture a sentimental attachment to our current one. Rather than take what we have for granted or greedily replace it as soon as we can, let's take a moment to reflect on the good fortune it has brought us. The day its map saved us from missing a friend's wedding. The dating app that matched us with our partner. And there's a couple of other examples. I wouldn't glorify an iPhone myself, but I guess he's, he's talking about um, a mental exercise. It could be argued that any mental exercise that yields a positive result is justified. But uh, I don't know if I said in part one, but I absolutely despise my phone now. I use a handful of apps. I'm more than happy to switch it off. I've gone way beyond the point where it's providing any novelty to me. There's a section called Stoic Virtue, and he explains uh, Stoicism began around the same time as Epicureanism, around the 3rd century BCE. The word Stoic has come to mean something related but different to its original sense. To many people today, it suggests someone dispassionate, cold and hard, but it's an unfair caricature. Tell you what we're going to do. Although I'm not mad on dictionary definitions, certainly they're not definitive in a lot of cases. You know, if you put happiness or love or those kind of things into a dictionary, 
have some merit. But it's interesting to see how they do reflect how the word is popularly used. So here we've got stoic or stoical, showing no emotion, especially when something bad is happening. <laughs> I mean, that sounds terrible. That sounds like, um, I don't know, if your family were being murdered and you just sit around showing no emotion. She remained stoic, in brackets, she did not complain or become upset, even as he continued to insult her. I describe my mother as stoic, but I think it's in a positive sense. She has a, a kind of a quiet strength. And I remember about 10 years ago, I was living in Italy and my parents came to visit me. And my mum had a fall. And in fact, she was very lucky because she just put her arm down just before her face was about to hit the ground, you know, a hard stone uh, ground. And there was, a, there was a big panic, you know. I mean, it is a bit bit of a stereotype, but I saw it quite a bit in Italy. They do like to be a bit dramatic about things and um, everything turns into a drama of operatic proportions. And everyone freaked out because I think, actually, you know, she fell face first. But as I said, luckily she got, she was going to go straight down on the ground. The thing about it was my mum was the only one remaining calm. She was just sort of, oh, yeah, I fell, you know. <laughs> So that, that's what I see as stoic, as, as someone who can keep their head, quote, keep their head while all around are losing theirs. Darren talks about the Stoics believing that the route to happiness was not based on the pursuit of pleasure, but rather that of uh, virtue. However, this Stoic word does not quite mean moral virtue, as the legacy of medieval Christianity leaves us interpreting the word today, but rather refers to a kind of psychological robustness. Stoic virtue has a subtlety of meaning rather lost on us, who might recall from its righteous implications. It seems to me that Stoic virtue is really what we now call being Stoic, the popular sense of the adjective Stoic or Stoical. Yeah, I like that, psychological robustness. Let's call it inner strength, perhaps that would be a good one. One interesting difference between the Stoic and modern sense of virtue is that the former is rooted in intention and the latter in action. When we think of virtue today, we might bring to mind instances of knightly behaviour, whereas for the ancients, the key to virtue was contained in one's mindset and is thus a little less easy to picture. Hence, they commonly created visual metaphors to help us understand their points, and continuing in the mode of Aristotle, these often would involve archery. We had that analogy earlier, didn't we, about archery? Intention was the key. Philosophy taught the Stoic student merely to aim the arrow clearly at the target. Whether or not the arrow reached the bullseye was a matter for fortune and not a concern for the student. So, yes, I mean, this is well known now, isn't it? It's the idea of you do your best. You do everything you can to be the best you can. And then um, the universe plays you a certain hand. Darren actually studied law at university. He brings up an interesting uh, hypothetical situation here. As a law graduate, this allowing of intention to trump outcome rings alarm bells for me. Imagine if, while driving your car, intending to bring a friend to the hospital as quickly as possible, you hit and killed a child. You would not expect to tell that story to friends and have them respond, Great, so good of you to get your friend some help. Well done, and no matter about the child, you didn't mean to kill it. The things people actually do clearly matter to us enormously in everyday life often regardless of intention, and certainly where harm has resulted. In their defence, the Stoics would most likely respond to this incident with a recommendation that you should report the accident, await your trial, and if necessary, patiently serve your time for manslaughter. On the one hand, you needn't feel terrible about what was not intended, but on the other, you would not expect to shirk responsibility if that is what the law of the land decreed. The important thing is that we act from a point of virtue as opposed to pursuing pleasure, by which we mean psychological robustness. Now we get on to judgment, and I heard an interesting quote, the human mind is a judgment machine. I don't know who that came from. You can look that up for me, folks. Here then is our first building block, central to Stoic philosophy and to the tranquil life. If you are pained by external things, it is not they that disturb you, but your own judgment of them, and it is in your power to wipe out that judgment now. These are the words of Marcus Aurelius, one of the greatest Roman emperors, taken neither from a public speech to motivate the masses, nor from philosophical teachings to be bestowed upon pupils. They come from his private journals and stand as a note to self from the most powerful man on earth. Though I just mentioned a bit earlier, Marcus Aurelius's book, Meditations, very much recommended. I think the audio book's available as well. 
Marcus ruled from AD 161 to 180, a time of near permanent conflict. His empire fought and defeated the Parthians in the east, as well as threatening Germanic tribes during the long Marcomannic Wars. This great leader was known in his lifetime and has been since as a philosopher king, and his, quote, blameless character and temperate way of life were praised by the historian Herodian as evidence of his erudition. His collection of notebooks known as the Meditations and composed while out on campaigns remains one of the most abiding and touching sources of Stoic thinking. Problems are created, Marcus is saying, with the Stoics, not by events in the world, but rather by how we interpret those events. That interpretation might involve a snap judgment or a more complex narrative that we tell ourselves, but it is this stage in the proceedings that leads to our problems. Hence, the same event out there in the world might affect someone else very differently from how it affects us. Likewise, our judgments about people are in truth responsible for how they seemingly make us feel. Nobody and nothing save our own judgments truly makes us feel anything. When we think of the variety of anxiety disorders that abound, as well as the debilitating, often bizarre phobias that cripple otherwise very balanced people, when we consider the triggers in our own lives that can flip us into an angry or even depressed state with the reliability of a light switch, it would be understandable to hold out little hope for harnessing the level of control over our emotional lives that Marcus is suggesting. Yet we might also ponder how rapidly we can correct an unhelpful emotion in life when, say, new information comes to light. We might be miserable that our partner seems coolly indifferent to our upcoming birthday, until on the night in question we return home to find a surprise party has been thrown in our honour. Following the initial shock, the feeling of hurt that had haunted us for days is transformed into something very loving. Similarly, we might feel rejection following what appears to be uninterested behaviour of a friend, partner or work colleague, only to discover later that their behaviour was explained by the fact they had received terrible personal news. Our self-pity and resentment would quickly turn to sympathy and probably an embarrassed acknowledgement of how oversensitive we can be. In these cases and countless more, we are correcting our beliefs about the target of our emotions, our partner, our friends, their behaviour, by allowing for new information to join the mix. A shift at the intellectual level has a near automatic effect at that of the emotions. Yeah, fantastic stuff. I've had this so many times in my life. I've made a judgment and it goes back to narratives something that he mentions in the book multiple times and yes it's happened i've made a snap judgment and then the person in question has absolutely surprised me and it just hasn't played out anything like i thought it was going to be so you've got to recognize these narratives and the stories we're all telling based on very little evidence a lot of the time we're barely aware that we're forming this he's always like this and it drives me mad story ourselves we're so focused upon the unreasonableness of his actions that we won't think of looking at our own role in the proceedings. Moreover, there is likely to be a deeper, entirely unconscious story also being told, of which we won't be aware at all. Our friend's behaviour makes us feel small or rejected or unconsidered. Our anger is a frightened, defensive reaction against the way such feelings resonate with our history of analogous experiences. These low-level stories set the scene for our emotional lives, greatly affecting the way we join up the dots when we react to -to day-to-day events. So let's acknowledge that when we find ourselves infuriated with people, irritated by our partners, annoyed, embarrassed, sad or scared. Those feelings are in truth provoked by an exhausting little voice inside our head and or from the exaggerated pictures we show ourselves. Another point I could add to that is, and this is something again I I have fallen victim to, thinking that when someone is very negative towards you, it's exclusively towards you, whereas you'll probably find, not every time, but in the majority of cases, they're like that to everyone. And I'm even experiencing it at the moment in uh, my other job outside of teaching and life coaching. There's someone who seems to be quite critical because they've been training me in this job. They seem to be giving me quite a bit of tough love, but it seems like they do that with everyone. So there you go. He then talks about letting off steam and uh, venting getting things off your chest, as we'd call it now. That's obviously a a good thing. I think, in a sense, the human experience is tension and release. So the tension builds up in our minds and uh, it's reflected in our body. And then we need to release it at some point. But obviously a lot of people release it in the wrong way, by extreme anger or violence or both. We can see the clear contrast between the discredited human potential approach to emotional release and the stoic position. The last thing the Stoics, or for that matter the Epicureans, would wish to do is legitimise negative emotions. 
Instead, we should acknowledge that it is our judgments, not the external event, which is creating the anguish. These men who fought with their hearts, who have families, who have children, who are filled with love, but they have the strength to do that. If I had ten divisions of those men, then our troubles here would be over very quickly. You have to have men who are moral and at the same time who are able to utilize their primordial instincts to kill without feeling, without passion, without judgment, without judgment. Because it's judgment that defeats us. In taking responsibility for it, we could look for a way out of the pain. Perhaps as you read this, you might question the word external. What about internal events? What if we are injured or debilitated by physical or mental illness? Surely such a condition could cause all levels of suffering. But are we really then reacting to something out there, as we are when, say, we make a judgment about how to deal with damage to our property or a mispromotion? The stoic response would be to still treat these events as externals, even if we feel that their point of origin is within us. We can still choose how to respond to an injury in the same way we can choose how we deal with a house fire. When the thick mire of clinical depression debilitates us, stoicism may, for some, feel far from their grasp. While it may help a person deal with many of the anxieties that could encourage a downward spiral, I imagine it would be very tough to find the cognitive distance needed to acquire the necessary leverage when stuck in the thick of it. However, absorption of stoic principles into life can still be of huge benefit to the uni or bipolar sufferer, even if they are of limited use when, despite all efforts, the worst times descend. It is, as Marcus tells us, always in our power to represent events to ourselves in such a way they give us an advantage. Two thousand years later, we think of this as reframing, the reinterpretation of a negative event as something positive, seeing the silver lining. Once again, the insipidness of the cliché robs the principle of its power. We tend to associate always looking for the positive with a kind of smiling Pollyanna vapidity, which might point to a neurotic refusal to acknowledge the disappointments of life. For that reason, perhaps, it tends not to strike us as something worthwhile we might employ to benefit ourselves, but more as a kind of social lubricant, a way of avoiding difficult topics in discussion and appearing helpful and friendly. If we touch on a problem in conversation and are met with something that begins, ah well, never mind, at least, we're likely to feel that the other person has little interest in what we're going through. Likewise, if you see Marcus's instruction as an encouragement to merely look on the bright side, we also miss its potency. Marcus is reminding himself, and therefore us, that we are to take responsibility for those judgments we make and to reconsider our judgments in a way that helps us. That involves a profound shift in our relationship with all events in the world and with our emotions. It is very far from being a rosy nudge to perk up. The reason why this shallow pronouncement fails to hit the mark most of the time is that it clashes with our deeper convictions. We cannot effectively choose to feel more positive about an event that is bothering us unless we have first understood that it is our judgments which are responsible for how we feel. An encouragement to see the positive in a situation will not be effective if it clashes with a deeper story we are telling ourselves. Wow, that's pretty deep. I would probably listen back to that if I were you, that last part. I remember when I was reading a book and I got to that part, I had to go back and read it a couple more times. But I think you get the general point there. A story that I did want to tell you, I think it was about the mid-2000s. There were two rugby players who completely independently of each other that around the same time experienced the same injury. They're basically paralysed from the neck down, as had happened to Christopher Reeve when he fell from his horse. And what was interesting is that one of them decided life wasn't worth it anymore. And he went to the, went to Switzerland, as it's now called, to the assisted suicide clinic. And he went through with it. The other rugby player basically made a decision that life was worth carrying on with. And I think from memory, he actually went to Switzerland and met with the other guy, uh, not necessarily to persuade him, but just to maybe talk it out and see if their different reactions might yield something positive. And uh, I think it's important uh, not to make uh, a judgment, there you go, about, oh, you know, one guy was lacking in character and the other one wasn't. It's absolutely not that. I mean, first of all, 
if you've never had any injury, anything like that, I mean, we can't possibly imagine how traumatic that was. But it was interesting how, basically, I guess the one who decided to live, I don't know if he he had decided that from almost the moment that it happened, once he'd recovered from the initial shock of it, or whether, you know, he reframed it, let's say. In this piece I was reading, but it was from a mainstream newspaper, so they have to frame it in a story, of course, that he's discovered all this stuff about life and, you know, I don't know if he said it has improved his life in some ways. Yeah, that would be a tricky word to use, of course. I don't believe for a second he would ever want to not want to turn the clock back and have that not happen to him. But it's interesting how they, um, two people who may well be of very, very similar backgrounds made a different decision, just illustrating that the events are not the thing. I mean, they are up to a point because the events changed both his lives profoundly, but one of them decided to end his life and one decided to carry on. Stepping back from the immediacy of our emotions and realising that we are responsible for them is a very good starting point for living well. We might insist that the Stoic model is difficult to apply to severe depression or misses the point where gross social injustice occurs, but the overwhelming point remains that taking responsibility for your emotions, rather than assisting the rest of the world recognise them and respond with perennial sympathy, is by far the most effective way towards sustaining relationships, solving problems and therefore living happily. We all know people who live in a world where others are perpetually to blame, who are always in the right while everyone else acts wrongly around them. Some people seem trapped in a need to elicit sympathy from the rest of the world. They may constantly dramatise, exude self-pity and appear eternally wronged. These people rarely advance or solve their problems without therapy. Interestingly, if we try to help them, our most effective strategy is usually to help them gain some distance or perspective from their emotions, an echo of precisely this stoic principle. After a certain point, merely sympathising with and echoing their grumbles tends to reinforce them. If you're someone who feels easily wronged and tends to blame the world rather than take this kind of responsibility, then this first building block may cause you to stumble. You may feel angry about it and insist that your situation cannot be helped by such thinking. You may decide to interpret this notion of responsibility as an instruction to blame yourself and haughtily insist that you certainly won't be doing that. There is no stoic directive to self-blame, to beat yourself up for causing problems. This part of their thinking is about removing pain, not adding to it or merely shifting it. In one passage of Meditations, Marcus tells himself to see those things that infuriate him as no more than the equivalent of sawdust and wood clippings on the floor of a carpenter's workshop. These things that obstruct us are the inevitable by-product of nature, and it would be mad to become enraged about them. This is typical of the Stoics aligning of themselves with fate, that is, whatever the world throws at them, but it should also inform our first impressions and stop us from interpreting events in such a way that makes us feel worse. It's the replaying of the event that sustains the problem. Anyone who's been involved in this kind of scenario will know how hard it is to not keep reliving the event. Such is the nature of trauma. Nonetheless, the Stoic approach allows us to understand what is happening and find a way out from the repeated self-infliction of emotional pain. Luckily, such extreme fight-or-flight autonomic responses tend to be triggered very rarely, and even when they are, we have it within our control to minimise the disturbance they inflict upon us thereafter. We could pay attention to our responses to events and the stories we tell ourselves about them. We could check to see if we are increasing the pain caused by a negative event by exacerbating things and searching for negative patterns, rather than simply accepting first impressions and events as they are. We could take responsibility for how we feel by realising that ultimately it is our after-the-event ongoing reactions to what happens around us that are the cause of our problems. The point of this is not to blame ourselves. It is to begin to dissolve unwanted frustrations and anxieties in our lives. Once we stop blaming the world for our problems, we can achieve some control. Whether we see our judgment as a cause or a constituent part of our emotional pain, the same conclusion remains for us as for Marcus Aurelius. Cast out the judgment, you are saved. What hinders you? Right, it's going to be the final part of part two of this podcast series. The chapter is called Relinquishing Control. There's a very, very simple message here. Don't try to change things you can't control. With this building block in place, we might now appreciate a little guidance on how to use it. How can we best apply our understanding that our responses are the key to securing tranquility? Epictetus expands, Work, therefore, to be able to say to every harsh appearance, you are but an appearance, and absolutely not the thing you appear to be. And then examine it by those rules which you have, and first and chiefly by this. 
whether it concerns the things which are in our control or those which are not, and if it concerns anything not in our control, be prepared to say that is nothing to you. If something is not under our control, we can recognise it as such and decide that it's fine as it is. That's Darren talking that last bit, and that's, that's a line that he used on a few podcasts that I heard him. It's fine as it is. Bear in mind again that it's, he's not talking about very, very important things, highly traumatic things. He's talking about the things that irritate us, which we amplify with our stories. In the book here, there's a line between what we can control and what we can't. And on the left, we've got under our control, our thoughts and actions. Not under our control on the right is a much longer list. It's everything else, including fame, power, the behaviour and thoughts of other people, our property and our reputation. So we've got a list here. What people think, what people think of us, how people behave, how well people do their jobs, how rude people are, other people's habits, other people's success, how well other people listen to us, how much our partner behaves as we wish him or her to, what our partner fears or finds stressful, and everything else. Now we get to relationships. In fact, the subtitle here, Relationships and Other Areas of Control. And Darren writes about things that are in our control, not in our control, or partly in our control. So he gives the example of trying to get a promotion at work. You can do the best job you can, but you can't control what exactly your boss is going to decide, and you can't control what perhaps your rivals are going to do. Now, if you do try to influence a boss too much by sucking up to them or playing games, playing games with your rivals for the promotion perhaps. If it's too obvious, if you're trying to control it too much, the boss might see through it and it might backfire. He talks about how we come out of one romantic relationship and the effects of that, which are obviously are often negative if we've split up with a person, we will then bring them into the next relationship. That's why obviously the more you go through life when you start new relationships, both people have accumulated a fair amount of baggage. He talks about... Um, what we learn from our caregivers, which are most people would be their parents, we will learn strengths from them, but we will also, without realising, internalise particular fears and needs. Our own personal ways of feeling a bit scared. Unhelpfully, these needs will feel to us entirely normal and rational. That's a very important point. We don't know what other people consider is normal. If you grow up, God forbid, with, I don't know, two parents who are both addicted to heroin and there's drugs all around the house when you grow up, Despite messages you might get from other people who have seen it and will say, this is not normal. If it happens from when you're born and you grow up in it, it's very, very difficult to convince you that it's not normal. They will resurface when we later enter a significant relationship as we project them onto our new partner. Although we profess to be in love and to have lost ourselves in this other person, we are barely at this early point doing them the justice of considering them an actual human being. They begin as a projection of our needs. We hope that he or she will be the perfect match, the magical other who will satisfy us. Like the projections we make upon our misplaced goals that we think will guarantee us happiness, it is an enterprise doomed to failure. Our partners will never entirely fit in with our plans for them, and neither should they. It is only when we stop projecting our needs, which first means becoming conscious of them as needs, that we can release the other person from the tyranny of our expectations. That's very interesting that your new partner has to experience the tyranny of your expectations. And of course, the more neurotic a person is, the more emotionally unbalanced they are, the more they will do this. And just to mention um, my other podcast, one of my other podcasts, Glass Onion on John Lennon, the popular view of John Lennon's psychology around the time he met Yoko Ono when they got together in 68, this has been said by John himself, he essentially threw all his eggs into the Yoko basket. This is a very common thing with a certain psychological type who's carrying a lot of trauma, plus, of course, extreme fame in his case. When he finds what he thinks is the one, he's going to project onto them and he's going to give them every ounce of his being. But he's also giving them a great responsibility to deal with all his emotional baggage. The emotional outbursts and manipulative questioning of a partner who fears abandonment are panicked forms of control which become more necessary and frantic as their fantasies are eroded. If we find ourselves doing this we may be trying to keep the doomed projection of the perfect partner intact but unconsciously we are seeking to self-sabotage and prove our private abandonment theory correct. Thus the hidden childhood script seeks to confirm and repeat itself over and over again and we may find ourselves in a string of such doomed relationships. We are likely to blame those partners 
while remaining unaware that our private fear triggers may be the true common denominator. Yes, self-sabotage is something that I was a master of in my younger days, and it took me a long time to realise what I was doing, that I was satisfying that script. And it was interesting that I was probably would have come across, I think, as one of the more cheerful people you'd meet, because I was hiding it. I was like a um, comedian. I always bring the most extreme example is Kenneth Williams of the Carry On films. Fascinating character. People who read his diaries years after couldn't believe that it was the same Kenneth Williams, because he would just go around being flamboyant and just being the life and soul of the party, and then he had this private misery, and I don't think I was anything of the level of Kenneth Williams, but it's very, very interesting. Kenneth Williams was a very odd man. In, in one way, he was just a practical actor. That was, you know, he he would, well, what's the job? Yes, all right, I'll do that. Yes, what time? Yes, where? Mm. And that was it. And on the other hand, he was, you know, his mind was seething with all sorts of doubts and problems in his own private life. His own emotions were playing havoc with him. And he, he managed to juggle those two things, the, the hard, cold professional and the very vivid, emotional man. And he managed to carry the pair of them with him all, all his life. Quite an achievement, really. You know, one felt, oh, please relax, please allow yourself to be things that you're fighting against. Stop fighting, just enjoy life more. I don't think he quite got as much out of life as, as other people. He used his emotions on the screen. When you look at him in carry-ons, he is shouting, he is being terribly snide in one scene, or he's being terribly ebullient in another. And he, he would go and get him back in the car to take him back to his home, and he'd be terribly quiet listen to classical music and read books on philosophy and so forth. Quite different. It's like he was a man working inside out, where most of us, we're terribly uh, straight in public, and then we go home and kick the cat, but I think he did it the other way around. These forms of control will, of course, come from both sides. They're part of the natural dynamic when two partners grow from the fantasy position of seeing each other in magical terms to a real-life appreciation of the wholeness of the other. The fear of being overwhelmed can lend itself to as many control games as that of abandonment, as an avoidant partner unconsciously arranges aspects of the partnership to keep the other safely at bay. There is no clear right or wrong, no worthwhile question of blame, just the intricate dance of two human beings living out their own internalised scripts. Ideally, as such needs are highlighted, we would allow our partners to guide us to a more conscious understanding of whatever shadowy authorities rule from the depths of their own personal history. And rather than control our partner to pander to our needs, we might begin to celebrate him or her as an entire separate human being, one with some disappointing peculiarities it is up to us to navigate, accommodate and forgive. Well, that's fantastic writing. And Darren has said in interviews that, and other people have said it as well, that the things that maybe you love in your partner when you get to that deeper understanding of each other and the relationship is those foibles. You, you get to love those things more than the more perfect parts of them. Now, just going forward a little bit, this is going back really to the, the idea of what we are in control of and what we're not. For um, Breaking Bad fans, here's a little bit for you. At the 2012 Academy New Member Reception, Brian Cranston, who was of course the lead in Breaking Bad, was asked if he had advice for his fellow actors. His answer is informed by stoic thinking and thus has relevance far beyond the confines of how an actor might best approach auditions. Quote, the best advice for fellow actors is this. Know what your job is. An actor is supposed to create a compelling and interesting character that serves the text and to present it in the environment where your audition happens and then you walk away. That's it. Everything else that happens is out of your control. So don't even think of that. Don't focus on that. You're not going there to get a job. You're going there to present what you do. You act and there it is. And walk away. There's power in that. It's also saying I can only do so much and then the decision of who might get a job is so out of your control that it makes no sense to hold on to that. Once I adopted that philosophy, I never looked back and I've never been busier in my life. Now, of course, there are many actors, you know, it's a tiny minority that get into Brian Cranston's position. And when he says, I'm not going there to get a job, obviously in reality, you are, but he's saying it's a state of mind. There's a Robert Greene book called Mastery, which I would recommend. And really, you want to be a master of your craft. I would say that, you know, you do have to play games to some extent and Robert Greene says this that life is a game and there's politics in everything there's another um, thing that people say life is sales that you are selling yourself to your partner but it's not like you're selling double glazing you know that image of someone knocking on doors and having to persuade them to buy something that they never thought they needed and don't need probably you know the door-to-door -door salesman but we are selling and I think there are games involved but if you can 
make it fundamentally about being excellent, your own excellence, then I think that will stand you in good stead. And then you'll often find that when you focus on that, things do tend to arrange themselves. I wouldn't rely on the universe completely, but things often arrange themselves when you're focused on the right things. That does tend to happen. I've just got a note here about, again, being stoic or stoical in the popular sense. As I'm reading this now, in the middle of June, I've just been enjoying the French Open and Novak Djokovic has just won his 23rd Grand Slam, creating a new record. You would probably describe him as being quite stoical on the court. He does have outbursts every now and again, but he seems to, after a while, in five set matches particularly, just develop this aura and I think his opponents pick up on it. I'm sure of that. And a very good example would be the Wimbledon final last year. Djokovic and Nick Kyrgios, who for tennis fans will know he's quite an, a fiery Australian player, great character. He, he's like, um, I don't know, for snooker fans, he'd be like an Alex Higgins or Ronnie O'Sullivan type. Yeah, he's that guy that you always get in sports who says a lot of the things that other people want to say and doesn't do himself any favours in terms of his career a lot of the time. But he got to the Wimbledon final and um, him and Djokovic seem to have become friends now. But if you watch that final, I remember talking to somebody I was coaching. Kyrgios lost that final because he just couldn't control his emotions. And all Djokovic had to do was stay there and not feed the fire of Kyrgios, in a sense. Just let it destroy itself, you know, consume itself, if you like. So that was what was happening there. Just thought I'd bring in something topical. Let me have a section on indifference. The Stoics referred to these external things as indifference. If we ultimately attach no importance to them, we can be sure that if they disappear from our lives, we won't suffer too great a pain of missing them. Permit nothing to cleave to you that is not your own, Epictetus says, nothing to grow to you that may give you agony when it is torn away. Because indifference exists in the realm of external things, it follows not only that we cannot control them, but also that we may lose them one day. Our property, our house, all the things we value fall on that far side of the line. We may lose our job and have to sell our home, we may lose or break our possessions and have to do without. Their continued existence in our lives is not guaranteed, and to act as if it is, is akin to a misguided presumption of control. Therefore we must relinquish that feeling of authority and let go of the attachment we might feel. Two powerful positive consequences result from practising this non-attachment. We learn to value those things more by appreciating their transience in our lives, and we are more prepared for the moment we lose them. And later on in the book... When we get onto the subject of death, obviously that's the ultimate loss. You know, we're all going to lose everything eventually. So uh, he's basically saying, you know, don't attach too much to things. That doesn't mean give up your house now, but it's, again, it's a mental exercise. Having that in the back of your mind, we're all going to die. We'll get to that later, but, you know, nothing is permanent. He mentions um, a movement called the Cynic Movement. The Cynics famously made a great show of their contempt for the trappings of ancient Greek society. When an admiring Alexander the Great offered their leader Diogenes, I think you say, you say it, anything he might desire, he replied only that the famed king move out of his sunlight. Early Stoicism, which was as much concerned with trickier notions of free will and logic as it was with ethics and the good life, took its cue from the cynics and ruled harshly on the notion of attachment to external goods. But later Stoicism softened a little in this regard as it became increasingly popular. Thus it became permissible to prefer certain external things such as wealth, family and social position as long as one didn't become attached to them. Obviously they expand on that, but it's this idea that you don't have to live with no possessions. I think Darren talks about this. The same as um, you shouldn't just live in the moment. You can have an eye to the future. You can make a plan for the future. And I think what Darren would say is you need to just find a, a balance between those two things. Another thing that... Um, is happening a lot more nowadays with what they call social justice warriors, is this idea of feeling guilty that you have a better life than most of the world. You know, most of the world lives on just a few dollars a day. That's the majority. But um, what purpose are you serving just feeling guilty? If you're going to do something about it, then fine. But just feeling guilty for the sake of it, it it's not useful. And I know useful sounds bit of a clinical word but a lot of therapists and life coaches they use that word is this emotion you're having is it serving any purpose is your anger helping you you know if your anger helps you for example to compete in a sporting event it might be useful but usually anger there's a point where 
it's useful and then you go beyond that point and it's no use to anyone really either yourself or the people you're inflicting it on right very last part of part two of this series the stoics and fate we're going to reclaim for ourselves the notion of fate often today when we use the word we're referring to how things will turn out in the future the stoics meanwhile use the term to mean how things are at any particular moment Although they imagined it as a force, we don't need to think of fate as meaning any more than the circumstances in which we happen to find ourselves. This relationship to fate is a fascinating aspect of Stoicism. Similarly, the idea of karma, what we understand in the West as karma is what goes around comes around. So you do good things, and either in the next life or ideally in your life, good things um, come back to you. But rather as with the secret, there are so many examples of when that doesn't happen that you can't just focus on the ones that do. And karma, in fact, in the East, is just to do more with the fate in the terms of what's actually happening, not your control over it, that it's going to influence the future. In a lot of schools of thought, there's the idea of this force, and Darren calls it a cosmic intention that runs through all things. To the Stoics, it's the life force of the universe itself and inseparable from it. Schopenhauer would, centuries later, touch on a similar universal propulsion with his extraordinary conception of the will, which is, uh, I think I've mentioned that earlier. We're not being told that things, quote, will all work out for the best. And like the equivalent Christian thought of God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform, there is no pretense that Zeus is arranging things to work out in the most favourable way as possible. There is no need to engage in tortuous theological gymnastics to explain why, for example, God has allowed babies to be born with horrible diseases or a shooting or natural disaster to take place in the sight of a blameless church. Fate is not looking out for us and we don't have to pretend it is. Externals are indifferent. Let's not mince words. If we are ill or a loved one dies, this is ultimately a matter of no importance to fate and the machinations of the universe. The fiery Logos could have arranged things whereby we would be in great health and the loved one would still be alive and well, but that would be of no more importance than the current less pleasant situation. The well-being of ourselves and others may be to us a preferred indifferent, and thus something to be enjoyed or secured where convenient, but it is ultimately an indifferent because it does not occupy that realm of actions and thoughts that is uniquely our concern. Things will not necessarily work out for the best. External events will proceed as planned without our involvement, and that knowledge can encourage us to treat them as they occur with a stoic qualified indifference. And on that note of uh, tough love from Mr. Darren Brown, that's the end of part two. Done nearly another two hours, so this is all um, coming out pretty epic, as I suspected it would as soon as I started reading. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you'd be interested in helping out the show, just sharing links and telling others about the show is helpful. If you'd like to make a financial contribution in the show notes is the Buy Me A Coffee page and also a PayPal link. And if you'd be interested in life coaching, I could uh, definitely incorporate some stoic ideas, or I think I already do, into my life coaching. Or you know anyone else who might benefit from that, then write to me, lifeandlifeonlypod at gmail.com. And with that, I will see you next time for part three, which I don't think is going to be the last part. It looks like we're going to be doing four parts my other podcasts once again if you're not aware of them are film gold and the most high profile of them is glass onion on john lennon about john lennon and the beatles of course but branching off into all kinds of other areas of interest and there's a lot of self-development that weaves itself into that podcast as well so for now all the best take care of yourselves and see you soon goodbye